Well, it's a pleasure to be with you all in the Lord's house this morning. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Luke chapter 7 with me? Luke chapter 7. Looking in the book of Luke this morning. Uh, we're seeing one of the healings uh, that Jesus did, uh, and uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, more peculiar healings that he, he performed. Uh, but this morning, I, I want us to look at uh, the man who was asking after this healing, uh, and how Jesus related to him, and how Jesus uh, uh, saw the, the great faith that he came with, uh, so that we can model it in our own petitions to Christ. And so if you have your Bibles in Luke chapter 7, we're beginning reading in verse 1 with the healing of the centurion's servant. The scripture says, Now when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum, and a certain centurion's servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loved, loveth our nation, and he hath builded us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned him about, and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent returned to the house, uh, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. And now let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you, and Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the example uh, that's given to us in it, uh, Lord, of faith towards you in Jesus Christ. And we pray this morning that you would give us that faith. And Lord, we ask that you would uh, be with us this morning, help us to understand your word. Uh, Lord, be with those that are not with us to give them uh, healing and comforts, Lord. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would be with uh, our missionaries that are sent out abroad. Lord, help them to witness Christ where they are, and help us to witness Christ where we are, Lord, and help us to see some saved. Lord, we pray for our leaders, uh, those that rule over us. Uh, give them a grace, Lord, and uh, give them uh, uh, servants of yours around them, uh, Lord, to declare the gospel to them and what they ought to do. And Lord, we pray that they would uh, do that, Lord, that they would rule this people rightly. Lord, we pray that where we've sinned against you, you'd forgive us and that you'd take it away from our heart before we bring harm to others, as we've seen uh, this morning, Lord, in Sunday school. Uh, Lord, help us not to be as Achan was, uh, to bring trouble on your people. Uh, Lord, we again pray that you would send Christ quickly and that you'd keep us safe unto his coming. And it's in his holy name we pray it all. Amen. So, the... Uh, Narrative here of the centurion who was beseeching Jesus to heal his servant. I'd first like to start out by mentioning that some people have brought forth an apparent contradiction in this story with the, the story that Matthew tells, the way that he words the story here. Uh, it's an apparent contradiction. It's not a true contradiction. Uh, we notice that in our passage that the centurion sent representatives from the Jews. He sent the elders of the Jews to Jesus. But in Matthew, we read that when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him. 
Uh, it says in, Math, in Luke that he sent the elders of the Jews, and in Matthew it seems to say that the centurion came himself. And this is the, the supposed contradiction here, that the two of them uh, were, um, uh, that they uh, are giving two different uh, accounts here. But the apparent contradiction here is easily resolved. It's not uh, a difficult thing to resolve. So long as we recognize that in those days, a representative was counted as the person that uh, was sending him, uh, that, that a representative, uh, in this case, the Jews, the elders of the Jews, uh, could be counted as the very presence of the person that sent them. It was a common way of thinking about representatives and messengers in those days. If I speak to a messenger of a person, if they deliver a message to me, I am to count it as good as the person that sent them. Uh, one example of this in the scripture is in John 19 verse 1, where it says, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. Uh, we know, of course, that Pilate wouldn't have done such a, uh, uh, a lowly task as actually himself scourging a prisoner. Uh, he would have put that out to his soldiers to have them take him out and uh, scourge him. And yet it is accounted that Pilate did this because his authority was behind it. The same, again, in the crucifixion of Christ, speaking about the Jews. In Acts 2.22, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. It speaks of the Jews as if they were the ones who by their hands had crucified and slain Jesus. This because they uh, were the, the instigating force uh, who handed Jesus over to Pilate and the Romans, and they uh, consented to his death. Uh, the messenger, the, the one who is carrying out the will of him that sent him, is accounted as if he were the one that sent him. And so there's no trouble here with saying that the centurion came to Jesus by way of his messengers, by ways of the elders of the Jews that went out to him. And so the apparent contradiction is no trouble in this passage, so long as we understand how messengers were accounted uh, as the presence of the one that sent them. And so, uh, seeing that, let's look at the meat of what this uh, story tells us about this narrative. I'd first like us to see the works that this centurion had. That he was a good man. That he was a, a man who did uh, much good, much uh, niceness towards the people uh, who were with him. We see first that he loved his servants. In verse 2, a certain centurion, ser a centurion's servant, who was dear unto him, was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. In the uh, Roman law system, servants, or in, in uh, as we also might call them, slaves, uh, those who were the possession of their masters, were not given full personhood. Uh, they were not treated as persons under the Roman law system. And this led to uh, quite a bit of mistreatment of servants among Romans. Uh, everyone in that day uh, had slaves among the Romans. They uh, bought and sold people like cattle. And yet this man, this centurion, cared deeply for his servants. He was dear to him. He treated him as if he were his family. Even when it came to pass that he was sick 
and he was ready to die. He didn't treat him like a disposable thing. He didn't treat him as though he could just go and buy another servant after he had died. Rather, he cared for him and he sent for Jesus as soon as he heard that he would come and heal his servant. This man was in keeping with the will of God towards uh, those who are under us. In Deuteronomy 24, 14, thou shalt not oppress an hired servant that is poor and needy, whether he be of thy brethren or of thy strangers that are in thy land within thy gates. At this day thou shalt give him his hire, neither shall the sun go down upon it, for he is poor and setteth his heart upon it, lest he cry against thee unto the Lord, and it be sin unto thee. Uh, it, it even says not to put off paying your servant for one day, uh, to, to, to give him what he needs on that day, to give him his heart's desire, because he is your poor servant, uh, you're to care for him. In Colossians 4, 1, Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. To treat the servant as the self is the will of God in this situation. Uh, of course, in those days, uh, it would have been uh, a curse to a servant to just uh, set him free because he had no uh, rights, he had no protections. But the, what this master did is he kept him in his house. He paid him what was fair. He took care of him as family. And so he cared uh, dearly for his servant. He was a good master to those under him. Also, this man had love for the people. He cared for Israel. In verse 3, when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. He sent the elders of the Jews, uh, implying that they would go and take his message to Jesus, that they would faithfully uh, deliver what they were uh, given to do. He sent them, he trusted them uh, as his own representatives. In verse 4, and when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this, for he loveth our nation. When they came to Jesus, they immediately, without any delay, without beating around the bush, they said to Jesus that he should come. Come and help this man's servant because he's worthy, because we love him and he loves our nation. He cares for this people. He, uh, not only for those of his own household, but those of the wider uh, Israelite community, he cared for them. Deuteronomy 4, 7, For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great, that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law, which I set before you this day? The, the man recognized uh, the people of God and cared about them. And his... Uh, his care for them, his love toward them obviously affected them. Uh, they, they were willing to bear his message. They bore it faithfully and they beseeched Jesus, confessing themselves that they believed this man was worthy, that Jesus should come and heal his servant. Also, we read that he built God a house of worship in that place. In verse 5, for he loveth our nation and he hath built us a synagogue. He built us a church, a house to come and worship in. This is the same heart that David the king had towards God. In Psalm 27, 4, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that I will seek after him, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Uh, this man wanted to build a local place of gathering to come together and to worship God, to read his word, and to uh, express love towards God. And all of this points towards the fact that this man feared God, that he uh, 
worshipped God. Uh, and he wanted the best for the people of God. See, all of the good works that he had done, all how the Jews confessed that he was worthy for Jesus to come and heal his servant. And yet then we see what the man thought of himself in verse 6. Then Jesus went with them. And when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent his friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. All the Jews thought he was worthy. All of the uh, external signs seemed to point towards him being worthy. And yet he knew himself that he was not worthy. It was not according to the custom of the Jews, of course, for them to uh, enter into a Gentile's house. They, they weren't supposed to do that by their customs. But this is uh, more than that. Uh, he said that he thought himself unworthy even to come to Jesus, even to be in his presence. He, in some respect, knew who it was that came to his house. Luke one thirty two says, He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. We don't know how much of this the centurion knew, but he knew enough to know that he was unworthy of Jesus coming to him. And yet, uh, we see what he says after this um, he knew that he wasn't worthy he knew that he wasn't even worthy for jesus to come into his house and heal his servant but he did show one thing he showed not only humility but faith in his humility in verse 7 we read but say in a word and my servant shall be healed for I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers, and I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. The centurion founded his request not on his works, not on his worthiness, not on, I have built a synagogue, I've done so much for my community, I've cared for my servants as for my own household, and all the people love me. Instead, he founded his request solely on the authority and goodwill of Jesus Christ towards him. He did not earn the grace of the healing of his servant. He only said, I know what authority is. I have a little authority. I have soldiers under me, and they do what I say. I have servants, and they do what I say. And he says to Jesus, only say the word, and it shall be done. My servant shall be healed. Christ's authority surpasses all authority on the earth. John 3.31 says, he, cometh from, he that cometh from above is above all. And he that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And Psalm 33, 8 says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Jesus Christ, who is above all, who comes down to the earth, is Lord of all. The same power that made the world is the same power by which Jesus commanded the healing of the servant on this day. The centurion rested uh, his confidence, his faith in the authority that Jesus Christ brought. And he knew that Jesus would not refuse healing to his servant, not because of the man's good works himself, but because of Christ's goodwill, that his whole mission was a goodwill mission towards man. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men, the angels say, as Jesus comes into the world. And Luke 4.18 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, 
because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. The fact that Jesus' authority is above all and that he wills to show mercy towards the servant to heal him is enough for the centurion. His faith rested on that, not on anything else. And Christ's own reaction to this tells us what great faith it is to rest all of our requests to Jesus, that we will receive them if we ask in his will, only on his ability to do it and his willingness to do it. In verse 9, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent returning to the house found the servant whole that had been sick. Jesus marveled. Jesus said that of all Israel in those days, all of the people of the world, there was that only this centurion, this Roman man who had such great faith. All of the Pharisees praying in all of the synagogues, in all the land, and in the temple, and all of the uh, people in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, none of them had as great faith as this man here who trusted in Christ to save his servant. His faith was great, just to, to put it plainly. And so Christ granted him his petition because he rested on Jesus' authority, his power to do it, and his willingness to do it. And so this morning, I'd like to make some application to us believers and that to our prayer life. How often do we think that God is granting our prayers because we've earned it or because we've promised to do something for him in exchange. Surely we have to ask God according to his will, but it's not because we do his will that he gives it to us. It's because it's within his will and his power to do it. How more effective would our prayers be if we grounded them solely on the good will of God, asking him by Jesus to give us the things that he himself promised to give us, food for the day, strength to do his will, uh, perseverance when we are tempted by sin. If we would receive anything from the Lord this morning, let's not appeal to our labors Let's not think of them as anything before him. But let's just rely on God's authority to give it and his good will towards us that he wants to give it. And Matthew 7 verse 7 says, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you? Whom, if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? If we were to ask Jesus, uh, if we were to ask the Father by Jesus uh, as his dear children, knowing his good will towards us, to give us the things we need to, to do his ministry, to do his will in our lives, wherever we find ourselves, then will God give us a stone for a fish or a scorpion for uh, a piece of bread? The Lord will surely not do this. And so when we pray, let's ask according to faith in him and not confidence in our own doings. And now if there's an unbeliever here, I'd like to ask, do you think that you're worthy to enter into God's heaven? Do you think that because people think you're a good person, because they praise you, 
because they think that you are a hard worker or you care for your family, that you'll enter into God's heaven. The Lord will not have any of that. The Lord will only have the righteousness of Christ that comes by his free offer of salvation. Isaiah 64, 6 says of our good works that we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags and we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Nothing that we do is any good. None of it avails towards God. Just as this man could not ask healing for his servant uh, on the basis of anything that he did because he was unworthy. Neither can you come before God and demand heaven because of any good work that you've pretended to do. You must only come because of God's authority to forgive sins by Jesus and his good will towards you that if you come in faith, he will forgive you. John 3.35 says, The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, but he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. There is your promise, that he has all authority to forgive your sins, and that he desires to forgive your sins. He's offered it to those that have faith in him. And so I pray you would come and trust in Jesus and ask after his forgiveness that you would be saved. And again, believers, as we go from this place, let's continue in that same faith in God's good will that first brought us to the cross. And know that if we ask in that faith, then God gives us the things we need to do his will. And now let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you and we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ, the token of your love towards us. And we pray that you would help us to have faith in him this week as we pray. Lord, we ask for those that we know that don't know him. Lord, that you would draw them to him, that you would open an opportunity for us to preach the gospel to them, Lord. And Lord, we pray that they would be saved, not trusting in their own selves, but in the work that Jesus Christ did on their behalf. Lord, we pray that uh, you would go with us and help us in that task, be with our missionaries and help them to preach the gospel. Lord, be with our leaders in this land to help them to make right decisions. And uh, Lord, not to think of themselves worthy because of all the uh, good that they believe they've done to society, uh, but that they would trust in Jesus Christ, that he would forgive them. Lord, be with those that couldn't make it this morning. Uh, help them, uh, give them comfort and rest, Lord, in peace. And uh, Lord, healing. Uh, Lord, we pray that where we've sinned against you, you'd forgive us and that you'd keep us safe until Christ's day. And it's in his holy name we pray it all. Amen.